<laughs> so, I'm, again, so I was, I'm, again, I'm Peter Desmoyers from Eastern University, for anyone who's joining Keenan Lake. And uh, so, what's next on the agenda is, well, and just Ron Krieger with me. Um, we're the director and co director uh, for iScale. And we He's doing all the real work, just to be clear. Yeah, no, it's, <laughs> yeah, it's your network we have. Uh, so, it's, um, so, we wanted to talk about the, the vision and the mission for iScale. Um, so it's I wanted to welcome you. Uh, there's there's over 20 companies represented here, uh, and eight universities have been here. Four with participants in the center. Uh, you know, in addition to everyone here in person, we've got about a dozen virtual attendees that were registered when I last checked, uh, including Lily uh, Ben Yehuda from Lightbits, <coughs> in Israel, uh, Ian Rosal from Zoom. Two from Alibaba Cloud, who very unfortunately weren't able to use the processing delays. Uh, we were looking forward to them. Uh, John Bennett from CA Research, Eric Van from Mar, and the Island of NVIDIA, Phil Schilling from Dell, Wes Wilson from Open Infra, and Brad Spears at JP Morgan Chase. Uh, so, and Peter Corbin. Oh, oh uh, we had new additions. Uh, a quick overview of the schedule. Uh, Aran and I are going to be speaking about the iScale vision and mission. Uh, then we're actually going to have um, <coughs> Brock and, and Blair Rudolph from uh, Red Hat and Two Sigma uh, talking about why they're already supporting research in the open cloud and why you should too. Uh, and then there will be a description of the NSF Industry University Collaborative Research Program by Mohan Kumar of the NSF. And after lunch, we'll have a series of presentations describing the uh, proposed research for the center, followed by an industry feedback session of the NSF, and posters and a reception on the top of the used camps the building down the street. And, and just to be clear, this is, these are, the ISCAL is the kind of, this is, every year it's on the we sort of had the second day of the MOC to describe research that we've been going on. This is a new twist for us. It's a part of the ICMC process to describe where we're going and stuff. And there's a series of also alongside the in the afternoon sessions, alongside the proposed research box, there's also going to be a series of tutorials um, in the schedule that uh, cover how to use NERC, uh, the, the production cloud services, um, how to fabric, and uh, actually the, the whole agenda we have on the books. Yes, yes. The, uh, the QR codes on the tables will give you the, uh, the schedule and agenda. Um, and then uh, the last thing before we get started, I wanted to introduce the team here from the NSF. Um, so Mohan Kumar is a program director in the Science Directorate for Computer and Information Science and Engineering and a professor in CS at the Rochester Institute of Technology. Um, and then Drew Rivers is our NSF evaluator. He's a management expert who did his dissertation on organizational factors that affect uh, the impact of this membership in centers like this. Uh, so, uh, the, I and the rest of the ICL team want to uh, thank them for the help they provided in getting to this point. All right, so I'm sure everyone here knows it, but we're in the middle of the era of the era of cloud and hyperscale computing. Now, some of you know I was in industry for a decade and a half before I went back to my PhD, but that was back in the days of enterprise computing, and the world's different now. So here's a few milestones marking the turning points, you know, how we got from the world of the 90s that I used to work in to today. <coughs> so you know, Amazon started earlier in the 90s and uh, got big enough uh, IPO in 97. Google started the year after. Uh, Facebook started in 2004. Each of them quickly scaled to the point where they couldn't use, they could no longer use commercial off the shelf systems that were never designed to run at that scale and had to begin building their own hyperscale architectures. Yeah. Then Amazon launched the first AWS cloud services in 2006, and the rest is history. The cloud has absorbed just about everything. Almost all the apps on our phones. And most of what we do on our desktops and laptops today are relying on back ends in the cloud. Uh, 
there was a period of a few years when business leaders said they'd never go into the cloud, but now they're bragging about being cloud native. So this is a tremendous change. You know, it's an industrial revolution in computing. It's moving from you know artisanal handcrafted computing installations to large-scale industrial operations. Um, a few generations ago, the same thing happened with, like, with electricity. The building on the left is a couple of blocks from here, actually, across the pipe from Fenway Park, and it used to be the electric power plant for Boston University. That was the era of DC transmission, and you had enterprise electricity. If your enterprise wanted electricity, you needed an enterprise electric plant. Um, you know, a mile away across the river, there's a modern power plant, a little one, but um, it's wired into the whole New England power grid, and it's part of the network of of, um, of electric plants that we take for granted today. You know, we no longer build our enterprise electric plants. Plug something in. Um, you know, more specifically, what we see in computing is going from enterprise computing centers to industrial scale cloud facilities. You know, um, and you know, with the uptake, well, you know, in a couple of years, the majority of of enterprise IT spending is going to be in the cloud. So clouds, it's done some amazing things, and one of them is it's enabled a whole new model for software development, deployment, and use, enabled by the delivery of services over the internet instead of software uh, sent out on a disk. We can know how the user is using our software in ways that we never could in the past, and we can adjust uh, and deploy new versions based on that information. The cloud offers resource elasticity to its users and access to high-speed networking. You know, in each case, it's statistically multiplexing a large resource or uh, resource pool across a large user base. It's got a rich and evolving service volume. Um, so half a century ago, the, the researchers behind the Multics operating system had a vision of the computer as a public utility. And you know, in recent in the last decade and a half, we've we've really finally achieved this vision. But there's a, a dark side to the cloud too, uh, for many of us, for the researchers in this room uh, and others. So clouds like AWS and hyperscale operations like Facebook and Google are proprietary and they're closed to most researchers. So you may be wondering why I've got a picture of you know some grad student in a lab with an auto engine. This is at uh, the Sloan Automotive Lab across the river. And he's got a car engine on a test bench, and he's doing something research into it. I have no idea what. Uh, now, what would happen if the car companies went and they bought Uber, and they bought the taxi and rental companies, and they started saying, we won't sell you a car anymore. You've got to rent it from us. You know, it's going to work for most of the people out there, but how is this guy ever going to finish his thesis? Um, you know, it's what about the industry and building parts and accessories and innovation in that space? So that's what's happening with the cloud and hyperscale. So one of the hyperscale operators um, had a meeting with academic PIs recently where they said, you know, if you want, you know, we know what the problems are. Only we know if you want to do relevant research, you need to come to a hyperscaler for a sabbatical and focus on your problem. Now, if you're not, we're not, you can't do that all the time. Um, only a few people are going to get to do that. And if you're not a faculty member for the vendor, you know, good luck, you're locked out of that information, out of these proprietary, uh, vertically integrated, clouds and operations. So if all the we're in the era of scale, but if all the problems of computing and scale had already been solved, you know, I could finish my talk and go go home. Um, scaling systems to data center size pose like a whole bunch of research problems that are at least that are at best only partly solved. I scale out to handle load because scaling up isn't effective anymore. Uh, the huge power, thermal, and energy efficiency problems that you have at scale. Uh, I started my career in networking. Data center networking turns into networking that I learned in the 90s on its head. We used to build a network. We used to build a network topology by wiring together buildings and geographic locations, and then 
networking uh, protocols would have to deal with it with the data center and build networks that tell us where to put our computers. Distributed systems have already been, has, have always been hard, but in the past, at least we could avoid the most of the time. But in the era of scale, just about every application is a distributed one. The loose coupling between use, user and computing has freed us from the requirements of backward compatibility that found most of our work a few decades ago. Oh, it's allowed an explosion of new services and compute models like Mapreduce, serverless, stream processing, and so on. The end of Denard scaling means that server computers aren't getting fast the way they used to, and this has resulted in an explosion of accelerators from GPUs to GPUs to tensor processors and programming the hardware. And we're only beginning to learn how to manage the sort of, uh, of heterogeneity. There's been extensive improvements in management and plugging at scale, but we're nowhere being able to be, we're, we're nowhere near being able to solve all the problems there. So these are only a sample of the research problems posed by uh, systems at scale. So to address these problems, we're here to kick off high scale. A research center to address researches, to address research into these challenges. Um, here's the iScale mission statement describing what we're going to do, how we plan to do it, and what we'll do with the results. We want to explore the unique challenges of computing systems at large scale across software, network, and, hard and hardware layers. That's our mission. It describes the research questions that iScale is being done to explore. We just heard a brief description of these challenges, but for you in industry, many of your organizations are actually dealing with these issues on a daily basis. Harness the competing demand within its universities to both inform research and provide a path for evaluation and translation into practice. So later in this talk, I'm going to describe a unique environment here uh, and resources for research into cloud and large-scale and large computing at our institutions, including the MGHPCC data center that uh, Leslie described, the Mass Open Cloud, the New England Research Cloud, and more East Storage Exchange, and the teams operating. So promote close collaboration between university researchers and industrial partners, enabling system building and evaluation at larger scale. I'm going to describe the research path that led to this collaborative model and some of the successes we've achieved as a result. So the goal of the center is to expand the collaborative industry uh, university research across the community we built and to involve more institutions, more research faculty, and broader representation from industry guiding our research. And finally, to push the boundaries of data center computing technology, bring these results to industry sponsors and train graduate and undergraduate students in industry relevant uh, technical skills. So here I'll describe our experience to date on maintaining a focus on translating research results into industry relevant impact through ideas, software artifacts, and education and how we can maintain these practices in a new research, in a new research center. So the, the iScale research model. In iScale, we're hoping to replicate the collaborative nature of the research that's been going on in and around the MSCG date. By collaborative, I don't just mean externally funded, or with an external passive observer, I mean true collaboration. When I look over my publications, I see a lot of industry authors. A few of these are traditional internship papers. A student goes for a summer or a term, works on a paper with colleagues there, and I help them finish it when they get back. But the other ones, the ones that are from the you know, collaborations leading towards iScale, are ones <coughs> where the industry members were part of the research team. Uh, they were participating in regular research meetings, helping student researchers solve a problem, 
problems, and in general, participating in the research in the same way that you should see my collaborating faculty members of other institutions. So this research model requires communication, frequent meetings between industry representatives and research teams. On the industry side, this isn't just someone tasked with oversight, but employees who are invested in the problem, often engineers working on it. Um, on the other side, it probably shouldn't be just the PI, but the students doing the research uh, work should be involved as well. I've got a bunch of, I've got a number of recurring meetings like this on my calendar with OPI students, partner engineers, and we hope to replicate uh, this model in ICM. So the second model is in a, uh, is cooperative development enabled by open source. So most of the work of industry in this field is open source, and when it isn't, research collaborations can use open source systems and models to develop technologies that we can then translate into proprietary project products. And the engineers and developers of these open source systems are the engineers at your companies. Uh, and we found that their involvement in research is invaluable. From the beginning of a project, they can assist and mentor our graduate students in understanding the systems they're working with. And as the project continues, their involvement can help translate the results into um, open source and the open source community and into shipping products. And we all know that shipping open source software isn't just a matter of slapping a license on some code and putting it on a GitHub. It's a long and difficult task with the upstream community typically resulting in testing, reviews, and modifications go far beyond what it took to get something out of publication. Um, my labs had multiple, well, Arad and I have had multiple features accepted upstream into Ceph, for instance, uh, we've got other pull requests outstanding, and the involvement of engineers from our partners has been invaluable in gaining the attention and respect of the open source communities. ICL values this model of active collaboration and will seek to have modest commitments of engineering effort by industry partners on the projects that it funds. Finally, for research to be truly useful, it has to reach the people who can use it. We're proposing that as part of a reporting process, each project will be responsible for an online presentation by the PIs or students, scheduled and announced so that it's available to employees at the member companies. So the goal here is to have a low friction, low effort way of conveying results from the researchers funded by the center directly to the people who can actually use the results with minimal overhead to researchers or industry members. <clears throat> Now, I mentioned that now ICL brings, there's challenges in doing research at scale, research um, you know, in how to build the cloud, things like that. The ICL institutions bring some key resources uh, to help address those challenges. So the first is the MGHPCC, the Massachusetts Green High Performance Computing Center. Um, a lot of you know about that. Uh, to explain where it came from, I wanted to point out that before Google and Facebook, uh, since sometime in the 90s, research computing departments and universities have been piling up bigger and bigger high performance computing installations. Um, you know, this gets expensive when you're in Boston, and nearly a decade and a half ago, the five big research universities in Massachusetts, so Northeastern, BU, MIT, Harvard, uh, UMass, got together, and when Eastern got together to build a data center. So you can think of this as a co-location cooperative. It's the building power pooling, some of the networking, and the organization that, uh, that allows uh, the institutions to work together. Uh, and then the institutions and groups within them are responsible for the actual computers inside. It opened in 2012, and you can see uh, a couple of the Rows here, there's we can have room now for a thousand racks on an eight room machine room floor uh, and 15 megawatts of power to this building with additional power for um, a second building on the same property. It's wired into the core of the internet with dark fiber connecting it uh, to Northern Crossroads in Cambridge, a fiber loop that actually goes as far as Albany and, uh, and Baltimore. This is the fabric guys are here. It's got two caravan links across the country. So, um, 
It's, it's currently home to close to half a million non-GPU compute cores, uh, most of them managed by the research um, IT departments and universities. It's a unique resource in so many ways, not least of which the, the collaborations have sparked. By putting us together in the same building, working with the same people, it's enabled collaboration which, you never, which would never have happened before. So for instance, the fabric code, basically, if, if, you bring, if you bring that to one of the universities in MGHBCC, you brought it to all of us. Uh, you know, sometime in the last year, uh, I, you know, I, was, I had to, we had to run a hundred gigabit link between, uh, I guess, it was between Northeastern and UMass, basically. We ordered the fiber and some transceivers, it took an afternoon to put the I just pulled the cable. Yeah, exactly. Um, I, I can't conceive of what it would have taken to do that, you know, physically in Boston. Um, I couldn't sneak out to get a photo of the uh, systems I've got in the data center. It's a two-hour drive there. Uh, but there's a screenshot of the monitoring uh, console for a few of uh, the racks that we have. It's, you know, we've got, it's a state-of-the-art data center. It's got modern, efficient cooling and power distribution, monitoring, um, and interestingly, it's designed, it's designed for research. It's cost optimized for research. So there's things like, you know, we save a lot of money by having a day of downtime per year and, you know, a lot more than the third of a percent that costs us. Um, and, you know, trade-offs like that to ensure that as much of, you know, the, the money goes to research computing. Um, now, the, the MGHPCC is more than just a building with a lot of power and cooling. It's this historic collaboration between the five largest universities in the state, four of them located within minutes of each other in the Boston area. Uh, I did my grad work at UMass Amherst, you know, at a big state school. My office is closer than here. Here, my office at Northeastern is closer than, you know, going from, um, from the management college to computer science on that campus. Um, and we have people from UMass here, too. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it sparked collaborations that never would have gotten, gotten off the ground before on grant proposals, research, education, and production services. It's also the leadership of the MGPCC. Um, John Goody was here, Jim Kohler, uh, and the staff who work um, with all our institutions. So beyond the data center itself, there's the resources housed in it. The Northeast Storage Exchange, Nessie, the 50 petabyte Seth Storage Pool, and 130 petabyte tape library, shared by the institutions, started with NSF funding and sustained with by buy-in. The Open Storage Network is basically a mini Nessie that de developed to deploy at internet to connected universities. Uh, they've got a network of sites at eight universities now and growing across the country. Uh, if you were here yesterday, you heard a description of the open cloud test bed. Um, you know, for networking researchers, there's a fabric node. <clears throat> so, I, wanted, I think I've mentioned a bit, but I wanted to get back to the, an important research, uh, an important resource is the research IT departments who manage the compute clusters in universities. Um, and I think about that. Their clusters comprising the majority of the computers out there in the center. These groups have been managing large compute installations for decades, since before Google's and Facebook's existed. Um, originally focusing on traditional high performance computing, but uh, recently they've been branching out to other services as more and more areas of academic research turn to computational methods. Um, which brings us to the Northeast Research Cloud. Uh, growing out of the yeah, world with it. Yes. Uh, growing and, and growing. These, these actually, the start ones here all are, you know, very closely tied to the mass open cloud, growing out of it, things we learn from it. Um, you know, the Northeast, but the NERC is essentially the, the commercialization of the MOC. It's taking the MOCs, uh, not commercialization, productization. Productization. So I keep getting, we gotta make sure we get sued for being not using non profit sites. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, but, you know, we, we started out with, you know, a bunch of students, you know, running, first we had machines on uh, tables. 
Um, now we have professional uh, IT staff who are actually running uh, the, the open, you know, like, like Wayne and uh, Scott, uh, Scott Yoko, like the more, um, who are running these, uh, you know, OpenStack and OpenShift Kubernetes services uh, for, you know, for broad use by, uh, by the universities with, uh, with the target model. And, um, Can we take that break? Okay. So, so we had this vision, and, and Peter, like, you know, had been so much of the technical body and stuff, and too much of the front face of things. But yesterday we talked about the mass open power. Um, and today, what we really want to do is talk about the future of the research collaborations behind this. And Peter's been the person who did kind of all the real work to pull these things together. So thank you, Peter. But, you know, like we talked about how the MOC started. Um, the collaborations um, and the unique relationship when we created this thing. So we did not want this to be just another regional cloud or another um, another systems research center or another um, open source community, but it's the relationship between these things that actually led to kind of all the results that have actually happened at the project state. Um, and I was going to kind of go back oh, before, but this is the MOC sort of spawned off a bunch of things, or they were created in the ecosystem between the MOC and the MGHPCC. And here's a little bit of them. I'm going to kind of walk through the history of it um, shortly based on um, Peter told me to reuse the charts I did last time, so I'll do that. But, but it's. Um, that sort of spawn is no longer the MOC, it's really the MOC Alliance, and we decided to keep part of the name. But you know, the engineers on the MOC are now working. Uh, so Scott and Wayne end up telling us, this is how you can set up a production offering at scale, um, set the requirements, and um, then they're actually operating the things at scale um, with facilitators who can help users do this. Because a critical factor is for this thing to kind of grow to the scale so that we're pushed by real problems. Um, so that we can observe the problems, as Peter said, that you can sort of see in some of the hyperscalers. Um, build on these capabilities that we have. So, do you want to exercise? Okay. Uh, yeah, I'll take a look at that. Um, so, as, as you can tell, actually, you know, our collaboration has been, uh, Aran gets up in front and talks to people, and I go back and I write the grants. Do the work, yeah. No, not the work, <laughs> but I'll write the grants, yes. Um, so, uh, a lot of the, <clears throat> so a lot of the achievements in the Mass Open Cloud have been enabled by, you know, the one thing that we don't really realize, we don't think about uh, in our field, is that we're working with software, which is truly unique. You know, anything else, if I build something physical in my lab, you, know, you can go and build it with you know, your company, but it can't magically just replicate um, online software. So, you know, we've all sat, I mean, every time you've used something based on Berkeley Unix or you use Ceph or Spark or any other number of systems, you're actually using lines of code that came from researchers at universities. Um, and this, you know, so, our field enables this collaborative model between the universities and, and industry that is almost impossible to achieve in most other fields. Um, and that, that works in the, in the other direction too. It means that, um, especially when enabled by open source licenses, it lets us take real, real scale systems and bring them into, and bring them into the lab so that our students can build on that basis, observe things in them, modify them, and implement uh, their research ideas there. Um, you know, that, that picture that I had of the, the student at Sloan Automotive Lab, if he had to build that engine from scratch, he could never graduate. You know, you, he's taking an existing system and modifying it, and that's what we're able to do. Um, even when we're working, when we're collaborating with places whose products are proprietary, we can take these open source models for the problems that they're facing. So, 
This, and what that lets us do, this can become this virtual circle that, um, you know, it then lets research results be <clears throat> go back into industry, um, into the open source community. Uh, so, you know, I mentioned some of our research results are upstream as part of the set distribution. If you've got set, you can enable them and then give it a try. Um, you know, Laurent's new kernel work is being argued over on the kernel mailing list right now. I do, yeah. I got an email from the thing that was the kernel mailing list for stories. Um, so this, this, you know, and, and this wasn't easy, but it was enabled by close collaboration with engineers from our partners who are themselves you know, valued members of this open source communities and were able to give us assistance with this. So this this, this two-way transfer of knowledge and artifacts can add incredible value to research collaborations. We're not just writing papers and sending it off for you to read something. Okay, so where's the mass open cloud today? Um, we built a production cloud, and Naran kind of covered this. We have a production cloud used for research, teaching, and actually the open source community and several projects in uh, the industry. It's training a generation of students, either through internships, operating and developing the MOC, being exposed to infrastructure technologies they were working with, or in class and class projects through, uh, for instance, the fundamentals of cloud computing course that we've offered on both campuses. And it's enabled them and involved in hundreds of research papers secure funding for uh, us, many of our colleagues. So one measure of the Mass Open Cloud success is a community. You can see this in the annual workshop. Uh, we had uh, 119 attendees registered at the first one uh, uh, eight years ago. Uh, it's grown to twice that size uh, before COVID, and when we were back uh, this time, we've got over 300 people registered. Um, and it's it's enabled cloud research in a way that wouldn't be possible without it. So I'm a systems researcher, like most of the faculty who are here today, and I can't do work in a vacuum. Uh, our work has to be informed by by actual practice. It's not like the physical sciences where you know, I can be pretty sure which universe I want to be trying to find the secrets of, but you know, here we're trying to build useful things and solve relevant problems. So if something's useful because it does something that someone wants it to do. A problem's relevant because someone has that problem. And you know, and finally, when we work on these things, we can't say that we've solved it until we build a solution and show that it works. <laughs> so what the Mass Open Cloud has done is it's enabled research with real users running real applications at real scale. And this is something that really hasn't been possible. Um, okay, actually, uh, so very quickly, you know, in, during the, the Mass Open Cloud, we, it's been both a research incubator and enabler. Uh, it's had a lot of, you know, originally it's just development on the MOC, then support from, for instance, uh, the Air Force and IARPA to continue that, and then a lot of um, additional support from NSF, uh, from others. The, however, um, you know, a few, few years back, uh, one of our partners, Red Hat, has recognized the key role that had for them in establishing the Red Hat Collaboratory, uh, and you know, which has supported um, a lot of the faculty who are going to be here today. And the iSkill is the next step in this growth. It brings in more institutions, not just Northeastern and EU. There's UMass is interested. Uh, we have, you know, in addition, there's a way for other affiliated researchers. Uh, one of the talks here is by a colleague of ours uh, at Tufts. Um, and, you know, it, there's, there's a, you know, and it's bringing in, there's hundreds, there's actually hundreds of faculty at the two sites and more. It 
the key thing is that we want to bring in more partners. Um, you might want to jump in here. So, so this is this is because we just needed this over is that we wanted to this has all been working. Like we've had a successful model of industry university collaboration. And I've been watching the charts of the things that would be so open source and everything. And that's been with Red Hat, uh, BU, and a number of researchers from other universities. And last year, we were, or two years ago, I guess now, before when COVID, we, we wanted to kick this off earlier, we wanted to expand this versus more companies and to more universities. And so Peter took on sort of the organization of this. But it's not a model that's already established, it's working with the Red Hat Collaboratory. Um, and NSF has given us the format in order to do that expansion um, for a successful model that already exists. Um, this incredible range of faculty um, and just the number of people at the institutions involved are unbelievable. Um, to run through this in this time frame, I just wanted to kind of quickly go back to this chart with a slightly different slant from where we talked about this yesterday, and also because there's a number of people that are different. But this kind of shows the relationship between projects where yellow or, or orange or something are kind of the major projects affiliated as part of the MEC Alliance. Green are projects that are, or, or red are projects that were research projects. Green are the things that have actually transitioned um, into open source, either upstream or in the process of it, um, or they've really been a part of the open source community. So, Again, we've heard this a few times. It started because we had the MGHPCC. We kicked off the MOC and fairly rapidly in the Red Hat Collaboratory, which uh, he was over there, my co director on the Red Hat Collaboratory, has been funding a whole bunch of the research that's actually already had an impact. Um, we wanted to move computers, again, driven by a real problem. We wanted to move computers between testing, staging, Production. We also wanted to steal computers from the other groups here, like Wayne. Uh, you, know, you have these HPC or HTC clusters, and they run at 99% utilization. We're running a cloud that runs at 30% utilization. So we said, can we kind of shift computers between the system? Why would you want it? was actually way to solve. Why would you want to shift computers? We're running at 100% utilization. It's the problem. You know, we're running at 30% utilization. What if I give you 100 computers, nine days? And you give me 10 computers on the deck and said, well, you're an idiot, but sure, we'd love to share computers with you. So the idea of actually being moved computers around was sort of radical. We have a set of fixed clusters. You heard a couple of talks about that yesterday, of how this thing got built. It turned out, and we also want to support bare metal OS research. Um, so the HIP project resulted. Uh, get higher security and make it faster. We had a series of projects that came out of that. Bare metal imaging, uh, which is a, a disaggregated storage. Um, and then for security, we integrated efforts from MIT Lincoln Labs. I think some of the people are here from that. And that now, hey, they, that actually is now upstream. Um, it's got a big open source community around it. And um, it actually is in production in IBM's cloud. I think there's a few IBMers that can test that now. So this is actually a product now, as well as to do major open source thing. To take everything that we've done here and productize it, a team from Red Hat worked with us to now transition this into using components of OpenStack, Ironic, and Neutron, and, um, and it is now something that is file tested code, supports a wide number of switches and many different types of computers. And this is actually deployed on a whole bunch of computers in the data center today. And it's, it's we're moving all the clusters, so we have these capabilities. Which is spawn new research like marketplace models. Um, out of that, because we could actually move computers around, we could build an elastic test environment uh, or an elastic test bed. You could know, cloud test bed, which makes things here for it. And that's incredible because every national test bed that existed from that was stood on a side of computers. And we have a community of people that all have the same publication deadline. What do you think happens before the publication deadline or the rest of the year for that matter? So, an elastic test bed. Um, it's again, Wayne and Scott are here for uh, the North Western Storage Exchange. Ended up, we had this experience with Seth. So they ended up building an at scale deployment operated by people that know how to operate these at scale, um, which is now supporting many use cases across the universities. Um, that spawned a bunch of research in big data, how to cache data for big data analytics inside different environments. 
the big word talks about that later on, but it was a whole conversation, you know, that whole set of presentations on it yesterday. That's all now either upstream, D3 is totally upstream, should be totally green. D4 is being upstream, the person, I'm not Matt's here, but we're talking about this as he was working uh, with some of our students and just expect to have upstream all this, which is leading to new models. Oh, sorry, then there's an open storage network. Which is these one petabyte data links around cross country that um, Peter talked about. That's leading to research on hybrid cloud storage. This is stuff you couldn't do anywhere else because all these capabilities have become integrated into this larger environment. What's that? Um, we have what's that? We have new models for a new volume storage, which is actually in the beginning discussion now in the upstream community that increase uh, 30 times in improvement in utilization of the back end storage. We want to use money to what type of back end storage for something, and we want to continue to be able to have this um, at ESI, we have to have the storage disaggregated from the compute. Um, Kind of keeps going. Of NERC ended up being Scott and Wayne saying, oh, there's, "There's a lot of users of the MOC. Uh, it's not really stable. It's, it's it was the best effort kind of thing." So now we actually have people that can know how to operate things at scale, operating the cloud services, and even much wider, wider variety of demands from the universities. Um, and this has sort of become one larger team. Am I saying that way? Yeah. So it's one larger project which involves both the production cloud services as well as the development team. The bare metal research, uh, different operating systems led to UKL, which is now um, a patch that's online, uh, led to new research, and it's actually led to other research like multi-party computation environments that actually run on top of UKL. Um, projects to on hypervisor uh, fuzzy, we have um, disclosed Hundreds of problems in virtualization, which is the cornerstone. There's efforts on workplace de development, and you guys heard a session yesterday on how this is impacting the education universities. I'm super excited about the newest member of the uh, MOC Orange family, which is Coliseum, which now allows us to do research uh, on edge all the way to cloud um, for our community. And projects that actually take the telemetry from the real cloud and kind of apply artificial intelligence to operate at scale, and then talking here about yesterday. And that's now leading to all this work. Yeah, three minutes left. Yeah, all this work that is that is the proposals today. Yeah. So um, I'm really not going to have much time to, to give an overview of the proposals, but each of these ties into you know it turns out this is this big organic you know network of research that's been going on that these proposals build on. And if you look at the interrelations between them, you see that each of them is um, as you know ties into work that's already been done, has been enabled by work that's been already done. Um, and so you'll hear more about these in the two sessions in the afternoon. Um, part of some of it, for instance, is building on there's a huge amount of expertise in accelerators and programmable hardware between our energy campuses. Um, there's you know, security, um, AI for operations, um, you know, and, and so on. So basically, I wanted to, you know, to conclude, you know, the computing world is on hyperscale. Uh, the challenges that that poses are far from solved, and it's hard to do research at scale, but iScale brings unique resources to this problem especially the unique resources for academic-based research uh, and, it's, and unique resources for research that you can be involved collaboratively with. Um, so it's, you know, we have the resources uh, and the researchers, and finally we've got, we developed over time, we've been able to demonstrate an industry-guided model for collaborative research that emphasizes communication and translation of results into industry-ready artifacts. And there's no way that our students could have, for example, made the changes that have gotten upstream down into the Rails gateway and are available to cloud. There's no way we could have actually done the UKL project without guidance, weekly meetings from Uli Drapper, Larry Woodman, um, on how to affect these changes into Linux so that we could apply new girls at So 
every person you talk about there that an impact is really being kind of tied into what the IUCSC model is of that industry university collaboration of engineers working with students and helping. I I know a lot about operating systems in general, but uh, we're being told kinds of. So, but, but but actually having those industry folks involved has been huge. Right. So basically, yes, we've been doing collaborative research, and we want to establish a collaborative research center uh, with all. Um, so um, next, so thank you. And uh, next, I wanted to uh, give this over to uh, two of our early research uh, partners. So, um, so Hugh Brock and. Uh, Actually, okay. we have five minutes for questions, so. Um. Ah. But like, Peter, like, when we did the IUCFC, I'm like, Peter's getting the whole bandwidth and control of this whole thing. Sorry for jumping in there. No, no. I saw that Tara was yelling at me about that long time ago. Questions, guys? Yeah. Sorry, can you say your name, please? Yeah, we've got some online for the. We have yeah. some online um, for my name is Atta Jury. Um, I used to be in Mosi, actually. Uh, I now work in State Street. Um, I'm a cloud architect. So, what is the next step for them? Because, um, like today, I mean, it, it started early in technology industry, but now in finance industry as well, we are getting this illusion with the offerings of the public clouds. Mm -hmm. not, not because of the capabilities, but because of cost associated issues. Um, and this can be seen easily on the products supported by the cloud divisions of these big three uh, public cloud offerings. So, um, and I'm hoping that like, we will have some solutions also in terms of cost optimization for us uh, so that we can start using it and actually democratize the solution so we don't have to pay premium. Yeah, this, that's a great point. Um, actually, I'm hoping maybe you can say a couple words about this, but what we're, everything that we're doing and, and we believe absolutely everything that we're doing is, is actually published, the configurations, everything's in open source repos, and our goal is actually to be successful cloud you know, for real usage and the incredible demand for cloud resources in this among the academic institutions to demonstrate that scale and make something that's replicatable and usable elsewhere with the goal of actually having that allowed to first, you know, other ent enterprises doing it internally, but also replicated and federated clouds between academia and eventually, hopefully, we'll have public clouds. If you look at it today, we look at the clouds and we say, geez, they're big. I can't say who, but the one of the companies that um, produces some of the software for some of these things, they're saying that in aggregate, the smaller service providers are actually bigger, they use their software as bigger than, uh, it's the third biggest public cloud out there. So what, what you're hearing is that, yes, public cloud is great, it's very powerful if you're highly elastic. We've got this, the, there's a bunch of reasons it makes huge economic sense now, and we're going to be starting to charge July, right? Wait. We'll be able to charge in July, because we have to, to make this thing continue to scale. But what that means is that we have now an economic model and demonstration that of what can be achieved economically to allow this to be federated and replicated, um, but also to allow clouds that we're non-commercial research. We can only support those domains for a number of reasons, but um, besides startups, but the idea is that this will, will continue to influence how cloud is done. And um, there's John Stump over there for Two Sigma. We, we ended up presenting a, a keynote at the Open Infra Summit this summer on what are the security requirements that we'd like to see in the public cloud based on work we've been doing together um, and testing in the MOC. So, you know, that will enable financial institutions like State Street to be able to exploit public clouds more effectively. Okay. Um I think uh, now, uh, actually, Aran, would you want to uh, introduce uh, you and Larry? Or do we have? Yeah. All right. So where's you? Oh, you just walked out. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Do you have one more question? I guess we have time for the question. Yeah. 
Oh, I'm sorry. I should have. So, Dan, I, so, so this was the very first person to work on the MOC as a professional engineer, and then left us a few weeks later. But, um, <laughs> um, so, my name is Daniel Ballard. I uh, uh, used to work at DU, used to work for Orana, and uh, I went to a uh, institute uh, uh, doing uh, fossil modeling for, uh, for biotech. Uh, it's formerly known as DNS Healthcare, now called uh, ATA Bio. Um, one of the questions that I had asked Oran early on at Oran and Peter was uh, what would the vision be for uh, people in the industry who wanted to deploy their product as an offering? On the MOC. Um, so, so again, yeah, it'll be the production services NERC that's stood by Scott and Wayne, but, but it's in scope to sort of say that if you're, you know, every app, every ISV wants to offer services inexpensively to academia, right? So the, the mall is we serve um, non profit uh, and research use cases, um, but, but Companies that would want to say offer software to those people um, less expensively through hosting, I you know that that's totally legal and a reasonable thing to do here. Um, is is uh, you know I, I think that business models are being figured out, but it makes a ton of sense for for this to be a reasonable place if it because it'll reduce the price to researchers to use services on top. Of it. Yeah, I think we. Uh, See that? Oh, there he is. Okay. Yeah, Q Rock is. Um, so we, we kind of uh, Red Hat Collaboratory got formed. Um, I'd sort of say that, this is my perspective as a Red Hat, we demonstrate the model of industry collaboration, and it was um, honestly challenging. You know, students are incentivized to uh, publications. Um, yeah, you know, engineers are incentivized to open source contributions or impacting products. Um, it's, uh, you know, Red Hat was very excited to start something here, and then you took on the job of leading Red Hat research and leading the collaboratory, and it was a learning process of how we could engineer successful relationships between engineers and research groups. Yeah, um, I, say, I think I sugarcoated that a little bit. What's that? I think I sugarcoated the process of getting to those close collaborations. Yeah, and, and I, I, like it was a commitment from Red Hat and Q in particular to make this successful. And the successes you've seen there, the things that have had an impact, are because of the set processes that have taken kind of years to develop, I'd say, um, on how to have effective collaboration that works across while well meeting the incentives of the faculty, the students, and the engineers um, within their organization. Um, so I'm really excited to have you uh, come and speak. He's, uh, he's been one of the reasons we've gotten, or perhaps one of the biggest reasons we've gotten to where we are today.